And I'm going to just open up this wonderful workshop today with an introduction of myself. I'm Christina Wynn. For those of you who, who may not know me, I am a consultant for the ICRR Business Center, which is the organization that is allowing this uh, workshop series to be delivered to you all. So I appreciate you all being with us this morning. This is workshop three of an amazing HR workshop series that Brandon Pendleton has been facilitating this month or no, last month we started and it's going to go through March. So I encourage you all to continue to come because this content is just so valuable and obviously it's being delivered to you all at no cost. So take advantage of these great resources while they're still available to you. Um, so the ICRR Business Center is a program again that is in partnership with the Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council. If you're not familiar with the council, um, they are responsible for getting minorities certified as MBEs, WMBEs, and then connecting you to opportunities with government, or excuse me, corporate organizations, corporate, 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 not government corporate, private corporations that are out there looking to do business with minority businesses. The council is the certifying body and also the connector to those opportunities. So make sure if you're not already to get connected with the council. So to give you an idea, the mission of the ICRR Business Center is to assist minority owned businesses who are in urban and rural areas with understanding and taking advantage of the resources and services that are being made available by the local, state, and federal government agencies based on what we're experiencing with COVID-19. And so our team has been created to bring education and training provided by subject matter experts like Mr. Brandon Pendleton in the areas that you see below. I encourage you to connect with me if you find that there's other information you're interested in that we can provide um, or create a workshop around or provide some training around. We are so happy to do that for you. So make sure you connect with me so that I can make sure those things are created. Brandon Pendleton, again, is going to be our expert speaker today, just to give you a very high level idea of where Brandon stems from as far as his intellectual property and human resources is concerned. He's a college professor at City Colleges of Chicago. He's an HR trainer and an HR consultant. He has been immersed in the HR space for many years, and I know he will share more with you about that. I encourage you to connect with Brandon on LinkedIn. You all will receive this slide deck after uh, the presentation, so you can just use this direct link to get in contact with Brandon or just search him on LinkedIn. And again, my name is Christina Wynn. You can also get in contact with me. I'm also a business owner like you are. I own a company called The Winners Club. We're a small business development consulting company. We offer business coaching. We do professional writing. We do workshops and trainings like these. And so I encourage you to get connected with me as well. Um, I have a newsletter and I like to share a lot of great information on that newsletter as it relates to grant opportunities, funding opportunities, and these free workshops um, that we're doing now. So make sure to get connected with me as well. Um, if you have any questions for the ICRR team as a whole or for our director, Irma Lopez specifically, please feel free to use this email here at the ICRR at CMSD, Chicago MSDC org. And as we transition into Brandon's presentation, I want to give you all a couple of seconds. If you would like to pull out your phones and scan the QR code, it will take you to our intake form. The intake form is where we can make sure you are connected to the newsletter. You can submit any suggestions or recommendations that you have and just make sure you're connected with us. So again, I appreciate you all being here. And Brandon, I'm going to go ahead and let you transition into your presentation now. All right, thank you, thank you. And um, let me say a hello, welcome to everyone. Um, I do recognize a couple of the names here uh, that, have, that have been in previous training, so welcome back, appreciate having you. Um, as we kind of talk today, some of the concepts will be a little reinforcement for you that have come to uh, some previous trainings. And for some of you, uh, this will be the first time that you're hearing some of this. Um, let me bring up my presentation here and tell you a little bit about myself and who you are going to be listening to here for the next hour or so. Okay, get it going here. All right, so 
Today we're going to talk about the new employee experience, okay? Um, very specifically, I'm going to talk to you about why this whole new employee experience concept is very important for you and your organization, why it's something you need to focus on. I'm going to walk you through kind of what a sample new hire experience process would look like. Okay, I'm going to map it out for you. We're going to talk about the different generations that currently exist in the workforce. And the reason that's important is because it's critical that you know some of the characteristics of the different employee groups as you set up your own new employee experience and new hire orientation. And then I'm going to break you out in groups and have you actually practice putting something together that I think will be helpful in your organization. So first, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, lived here in Chicago about 20 plus years. I was a journalism major at the University of Missouri in Columbia, where I had an emphasis in advertising and public relations. Um, I used to be my first job out of college. I was a driver of the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. Yes, my first job was driving a big 45 foot long hot dog all over the nation. Okay, one year internship. Fun year allowed me to see the whole country. I've been to just about every major city, every major sporting event. So it was a real fun year. Um, after I did that, I decided to go back to school and I went to the University of Illinois down in Champaign where I majored in human resources management. That's where I got my master's, what I got my master's degree in and started my corporate career. I've spent um, I keep saying I need to correct that and I always forget 20 plus years actually in corporate America uh, working in a lot of different industries. I started my HR career in the automotive industry. So I worked for Ford Motor Company. I worked in diversity and work life planning. I also worked at a, uh, in an assembly plant working directly with labor and labor unions, etc. Uh, fun fact, that's actually how I got to Chicago. When I graduated from Illinois, I lived in Detroit for a year and they transferred me here to Chicago to work at the assembly plant on the south side of the city, 130th and Torrance. So that's how I got to Chicago some years ago. Left the automotive industry, went into the financial services industry. I was a director at Citibank, specifically over the Diners Club business unit. Left Citibank, went into the nonprofit world. I was the vice president of HR for Boys and Girls Clubs of Chicago, the greater Chicagoland area. Left there, went into the retail industry. I was a director of HR at Sears Corporation um, out in Hoffman Estates. And then I left there and I went into the educational space and I was the director of HR for Harold Washington College. Um, that's actually where I met Christina. I did that job probably the longest of my career. I was in that role for about eight years. Left there and went into the utility industry briefly, Integris Energy Group, and then decided to come back into the education space in a different capacity, which was follow my passion, which is teaching. And I've now been teaching as a college professor at Harold Washington College now for the last um, six plus years. I teach in the business department, HR, et cetera. So that's a little bit about me. So as uh, Christina mentioned, I've just been immersed not only in the business world, but in the HR space my entire career. In addition to that, which is not listed, I also do training for the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. And I've done that for about the last 10 years. So that's what kind of introduced me to individuals like yourself this kind of small business space. And I started to quickly realize that a lot of the HR concepts that we think about in big business, you know, big corporations, are the same types of things that we need to think about with small businesses. So as I started developing these type of training modules, my focus was to come up with real practical things that you as small businesses can take back and use to try to work with your kind of human resource and human capital strategy, okay? So that's a little bit about me. So let's kind of talk about what's going on. Now, I will tell you, um, those of you that have been in trainings of mine before, I am not shy to call on people, okay? I believe this is a training, but I think for training to be more fruitful for you and to get more out of it, you got to respond, you know, we got to talk, you know, a good energy flow. Um, the beauty of being on WebEx is I can see names here on my little sheet. So I will not hesitate to call on you to kind of help make this conversation fruitful, okay? So with that being said, let's just kind of start with some basic questions about COVID, okay? We're going to kind of package this whole thing in this whole COVID space. So I always ask, how has the coronavirus impacted you? Did you feel you were prepared? What have you learned about your employees going forward? So who wants to tell me about that? I do remember, Alexis, you were in my last training, and I picked on you before. So I'm going to give you a pass on this question today, okay? But 
Um, we got some new people. So who wants to, who first, I always give people an opportunity to volunteer before I call on you. So who wants to share with this? Tell me how COVID has impacted your organization. More specifically, how has it impacted you with respect to your employees? Who wants to share? Anyone? Nobody's putting a hand up. Okay, it means I got to pick on somebody. Okay, who am I looking at? Latoya, I'm going to pick on you. Tell me, how has COVID impacted your organization? You care to share? Hello? Maybe she's reaching for the mic, okay, to unmute herself. Latoya, no, you're not going to share? Okay, Tanya, what about you? Ms. Cook. And I see names here, so I'm calling on people. Hello? Hi, Ms. Cook, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right. <laughs> First well, of all, how, yeah, how, how has COVID impacted your organization, specifically with respect to your employees? Like, did you feel they were prepared? Uh, did it kind of show you who your good employees were and who your not so good employees were? Tell me how it's impacted your organization. Well, actually, uh, I am here uh, as an independent healthcare consultant. Oh, okay. And, and uh, with a focus on HR solutions. So I thought this would be um, quite interesting. But I will tell you, as far as my recruitment is okay. concerned, um, the coronavirus pandemic in the beginning, um, I made a whole lot of money. You know, I, <laughs> I, I was in demand. I mean, <laughs> I'm just telling you, you know, I was in demand a lot. I had to hire some people. And then uh, when the second and third wave came, um, I had to change um, the way, um, you know, my, my contracts kind of changed uh, because um, the demand was a little bit different. Um, the organizations, uh, well, with the, you know, with the different, um, um, should I say the mandates, if you will, it kind of changed everything. And so everything kind of slumped down. So it's been up and down, up and down, up and down like that. But right now it's kind of picking back up because the staffing agencies now, which is who I staff for, they're kind of, you know, in control right now because they're paying the most, you know, um, a lot of the healthcare um, uh people, if you will, you know, they're leaving uh, the floor, they're, they're leaving the hospitals uh, and they're going to the staffing agencies, you know, and the staffing agencies are charging more and more and more. I mean, I know you've seen that in the news. So um, it's been an up and down thing. Um, and I do believe that it will level out at some point, maybe within the next six months, hopefully, you know, but it, it has been a challenge, but it's also, I, I've also learned a whole lot. Okay, and so um, I'm not saying I'm glad it came, but it, it just just made me rethink the way that I do things and um, different avenues that I can um, do business in. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm going to kind of um, um, uh, piggyback on something that you kind of talked about when you said you learned some things. You know, it, it, it made you start to rethink how you've been doing things. And I think that when you talk about how COVID has impacted organizations, especially from a small business standpoint, that's really what the big takeaway is. Now we realize coming back that we have to rethink how we've done things. And what I'm going to focus on today is rethinking how you bring employees into your organization, understanding what's important to them and who they are. Because as I was sharing with one of your um, colleagues before we formally started the meeting, it's an employee world out there. Everybody is looking to bring people on board. And employees that are out there, candidates, they realize that the world is their oyster right now with respect to employment. And if I go to this one place and I'm there a couple of months and I don't like what's going on, I can just get up and leave and know that I can have another job probably within a couple of weeks. That's what we're dealing with here. So how is it we can make sure that the employees that we spend all our time and energy recruiting and bringing into our organization 
How is it we can make sure that they stick around? And one of the ways we do that is by understanding who they are and what's important to them. So when I talk about that, what I'm really asking is, what is it that matters to new employees? There's been a lot of research done about this, okay? You know, when you think about, there was this kind of old model that thought, okay, the only thing that matters to a new employee is how much money are they making? How, what's the paycheck? Okay, that's really it. You pay people a lot of money, they're going to stick around, they're not going to have an issue, whatever the case may be. Well, I think we all know that that's not necessarily the case. So there's been a lot of research, a lot of charts, a lot of work done around this, and these are some of the things that have come out of that, okay? Now, I'm not going to belittle money. Of course, them making a paycheck and, 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 and being able to uh, make a living and earn a living is important to them. But these are some of the things that have popped up as being equally important, okay? Things like the purpose. Why am I here? Am I at an organization that I feel like I have a purpose, okay? Respect is important to them. Empowerment. Whatever organization I'm in, do they provide me with the tools to be able to do what I need to do and allow me to do that, okay? Inclusiveness, right? We know what's going on in today's world, right? Um, with the, the murder of George Floyd, a couple of years ago, it really, really, really pulled the lid off of this whole diversity inclusiveness thing, both from a social justice standpoint and from a work standpoint, right? Every time you turn on the news, you're hearing about some new diversity initiative or whatever that companies are starting to do. Um, the challenge, is my work challenging to me? Does it challenge me? Does it stimulate me mentally and make me want to give the best I can? And three things that really came out of it is opportunity, culture, and community. When employees are coming into your organization, one, they want to feel that they are going to have an opportunity to shine and show you what they can do. Also, maybe have an opportunity to move within your organization. I know a lot of you that are small businesses may think, okay, well, I really don't have a lot of promotional opportunities, but guess what? Employees are also interested in a breadth of knowledge as well. So are there opportunities for me to move throughout the organization and learn different skill sets? Culture came up as being extremely important to them, okay? As you know, culture is defined as the shared values, beliefs, and behaviors of any organization, right? So is it a culture that I feel I fit into and I can be a part? Translated, I feel like I'm part of a community. So as we've seen the research come in, these are the things that are important to new employees. So in order to make sure you're honing in on this and touching this like you should, you have to put together a very well thought out, very focused, what I call new employee experience, okay? Now, why is it important to come up with something like that? Well, one, a new employee experience will help employees develop this kind of emotional commitment to the organization. Remember when I said one of the things that they talked about is having a purpose. Well, how do you give them that purpose? It starts when they come on board. And if you do it right within the first you know, week, uh, a month, 90 days, you'll start to develop that commitment. They'll feel that sense of purpose, okay? When they do that, guess what? It's going to lead to them giving you extra effort because they're invested. They genuinely care. Um, I can speak to that personally. You know, I told you I'm a college professor at Harold Washington College. I left the corporate world to go and teach. Why? Because I'm invested, because I care, okay? I can make a lot more money going back into the corporate world. But I'm, I, I genuinely care about the students and their success, and it's something that gives me my own sense of purpose. If you can develop that in your employees, they're going to give you that extra effort. Having a new employee experience will help develop trust between you and your employees. Why is that important? Well, if employees feel like they can trust you, they're going to be more likely to collaborate with you, and they're going to make sure that they give you a higher quality of work okay, because they trust, they have a good relationship with you. And finally, a new hire experience, a new employee experience helps your organization be a lot more deliberate in integrating them into your organization. That's a big key with a lot of the HR things that I teach. Um, um, people that have been in other trainings of mine, one little thing that I always say is you have to look at your employees as investments and not expenses, okay? And that's a paradigm shift. That's a mindset change. 
because my logic there is when you look at employees as investment, that means you're going to be a lot more deliberate in every process you design that has to do with them, from your recruiting to your onboarding to your performance management, okay? Because think about it. Think about it logically, right? We view investments very different when we do expenses. Expenses, that's a bill, okay? Something I have to pay. It gets on my nerves. I want to keep it moving. Not a lot of effort. But when something is an investment, what do we do? We spend a lot more time, a lot more energy, a lot more effort to make sure we're getting it right. So when you put these processes in place, my hope is that as an organization, you start to develop that mindset, which is going to lead to you being a lot more deliberate, okay? So let me give you an example of what a potential new employee experience would look like, okay? What am I talking about? Let me give you a sample of a potential new hire orientation. And again, I'm not saying do this, but I'm just kind of laying one out for you um, on how it potentially can look. And of course, you can scale this and fit this for whatever will work for your organization. And you're actually going to get some practice with this later when I do the class activity. But here's how I want you to think about it. Think about the new hire experience or the new employee experience in four stages, right? There is what do you do before the new employee even comes on board? What is it you do? Then what do you do for them? The second stage is what are you doing on the very first day that they show up for work? The next one is what are you doing after the first month that they've been there, those 30 days? And then finally, what are you doing sometime within that 90-day period, that kind of three-month period? So if you look at it in those four buckets, okay, that gives you a very deliberate, well-thought-out, have a new hire orientation that you're bringing them in to have them get that emotional connection with you. So let me give you a sample on how that might look, okay? What is it you might do, let's say, on their first day, okay? Well, let's even go before this. Before this, you're making sure everything is set up, right? So when I say being deliberate, you're setting all the activities up that you would do even before you get to this first day. So when they show up on the first day, Maybe it starts with a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you, the company owner, the person who's in charge. It's funny. I remember when I was at Integris Energy Group, okay, my very first day on the job, the first day, the CEO of the company actually came by my cubicle. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say it was just, oh, they set it up like that. But what I did find out later was that the CEO of Integris Energy Group, his office was actually in Green Bay, Wisconsin. He was in town for a meeting here in Chicago that week. My supervisor specifically told him that he had a new HR director starting that day and told him exactly where I was going to be. And the CEO of the company actually walked over to my queue my first day on the job and introduced himself. And I'm sitting there with this look on my face like, Wow, like I'm talking to the person who's in charge of the whole enterprise. And it was a brief meeting. You know, he said hi. He introduced himself, told me a little bit about his background, welcomed me to the team, you know, that type of thing. So, again, for your employees, especially in a small business space, on the first day, why don't you meet with them, talk with them? Maybe you take them on a tour of the offices and explain to them what each department does or what each person is responsible for. While you're meeting with them, you're giving them a history of the company. Tell them where you came from, where you started, how you got where you are, those types of things. You want to schedule a team meeting possibly with the entire organization. Maybe that's what you do. So their first day on the job, right, you're already building that connection because you're introducing them to everyone so they know this is the team, okay? Maybe going to lunch with you that day or something like that. Here's another idea that helps build that, swag, okay? Maybe you haven't thought about that. But this could be something you do in your organization. It doesn't cost a lot of money to get some T-shirts made or a coffee mug, okay? Just these little things for their first day. Going back to that Integris um, example I gave you, not only did I meet with the CEO on the first day, I remember when I came to my cubicle, they had a little sign hanging on my cubicle with a picture of all of them saying how excited they were of me coming to the team. And then when I sat at my desk, they had me a little T-shirt with the company name on it. They had bought me like a little basket with some little trinkets and candy and stuff in it or whatever, and a little bitty card, handwritten card from my boss that he had laid on my keyboard saying welcome, and he looks forward to meeting me. He was like, I'm in a meeting right now, but we're scheduled to meet at noon, et cetera, et cetera. Just those little things kind of built that kind of connection that I talked about. 
What might you do within the first week? Okay, here's some things, right? Have the new employee shadow other employees in the organization, right? So instead of just the old school way of showing them their desk and putting them in a cubicle and they just kind of have to figure out what their next move is here and there, you need to have that plan for them. So maybe you have them shadow other people, which means obviously before they get there, you would have had to talk to the other employees to let them know exactly what's going to be going on. Here's another thing too. Put them to work instantly. We're going to talk about the generations here in a minute, but just because they're new, they're eager. They're ready to show you what they can do. So beforehand, maybe you should have already thought about a very specific project that you can give to them and give it to them in their first week. Now, obviously, they have to still learn the nuances of your company, but you hire them for a reason. So give them an opportunity to show you what they can do, okay? Maybe sometime during that week you have some sort of a follow-up meeting, okay? Maybe it's with you or another high-level employee. And this is just kind of a check-in. Hey, just want to see how you're doing, checking in with things, let's walk through what's been going on, et cetera, et cetera, okay? What do you do the first month? Well, sometime within that first month you want to follow up. That project that you gave them, right, that I talked about, now would be a great chance to follow up and see how did things go. You know, what did they learn? What questions did they have? This is a great opportunity, one, for you to kind of see what their skill sets are. It makes them feel like they're integrated into the organization kind of right out the box. You're also starting to, remember I talked about that trust, right? You're developing that relationship with them just by following up and talking about their assignment. It also gives them an opportunity to start to understand what your expectations are and what that looks like, okay? Here's another idea. Maybe at the conclusion of a month, have the employee do a self-evaluation. You know, it doesn't have to be this big, long, hour-long thing. It can be a little one-page thing where you're like, hey, tell me how you think you've been doing here your first month. Give me some feedback. And maybe you can use that as the catalyst for a discussion with them. Again, I think you see kind of a theme here, things that are integrating them within your organization. And then finally, and their first three months, okay, the traditional probationary period, here's a cool little thing, present them with something, right? That's something major, some little kind of cheesy thing like this, right? You know, get a little certificate or something. You can find a million of these things online. Just kind of a little, hey, you made it. Not necessarily you made it, but, you know, you made it 90 days, and you can make it real kind of festive, you know, maybe order some donuts in your next meeting or whatever the case may be. But I think you see the point I'm getting at. Engaging in these type of activities gives that new employee this feeling that I am really being welcomed into this family that is your organization, okay? So in order to even do something like this, right, in order to kind of put something together like this and to put the parameters together, you kind of got to have an understanding on who these employees are. So. There are, for the first time in our work history, there are five different generations in the workforce at the same time, and all of them have a number of different characteristics. So I'm going to kind of briefly walk you through what these characteristics are. The reason this is important is because as you're setting up that new hire orientation, that new employee experience, you kind of want to have some social cues to understand who are these people that you're dealing with, and that's going to help you in designing whatever things you put into that first day, first week, first 90 days, et cetera. So let's start with our veterans, okay? Our veterans, these are individuals who are born between 1922 and 1945, okay? They're very disciplined. They prefer face-to-face -face communication. They're all about teamwork. Just some little nuances about them, they love rules. Okay, they're all about what's the rules, what is it we're supposed to do. They're all about command and control. So obviously, if you've hired an, an extremely older worker here recently in your organization, it's important to kind of know this. So as you're setting up your kind of new employee experience, you kind of recognize going in, okay, a lot of face-to-face -face is important. So remember when I said those kind of one-on-one meetings that you have with them, you recognize, okay, that's going to be beneficial to them. Remember I told you they're all about the rules, right? So you recognize with talking with them, you probably need to be a little more, okay, here's what I expect you to do because they're going to respond better to that. Tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do so I can go off and do it, okay? Our next group, our baby boomers, okay? The largest population that's out there. To understand then, you got to understand where they came from, right? They were born right after World War II when the world was a little different. We were very optimistic. 
Most of them grew up in two-parent households, okay? That's how they grew up. They prefer face-to-face -face communication as well. What's some kind of general characteristics of them? They are workaholics, okay? They will stay there from 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening if you let them. So, again, as you're kind of designing this new hire experience for them, recognize you're dealing with a group of people who, you know, they like meetings, okay? They're not necessarily about work-life balance. So if you're dealing with a baby boomer and you're thinking, okay, I need to figure out a way to give you a flexible schedule, might not necessarily appeal to them as much, okay? They're all about money and titles. That's how you tell them they're doing a good job. So when you're talking with them for their new hire experience, maybe one of the things that you want to make sure you're clear with them on is what are those potential promotional opportunities for them later on down the line or whatever the case may be. So again, just kind of understanding some characteristics of this group can help you. Generation X, my generation, okay? Well, who are we? Well, we came in, we were born at a time when there was a lot of change going on, okay? There was also an economic recession. We're known as the latchkey kid, okay? Um, either our parents were divorced or they were working, okay? So because of that, we were very independent, okay? I remember coming home from school. I remember at a very, very young age when I was in grade school, my key was pinned into my pocket because when I came home from school, I had to let myself in the house because my mom was working two jobs and she was a single parent. So when I got home, nobody was home. So I had to kind of basically learn to fend for myself a little bit. I knew where the cereal was and where the saltine crackers and the orange juice was, and I would sit and start watching my cartoons or whatever the case may be. Well, a lot of Gen Xers kind of came from that. So because of that, you understand what they're accustomed to and what appeals to them, okay? They like feedback, okay? We like feedback. We want to know, how are we doing? Tell me what's going on. We might challenge you a little bit, but it's not challenging coming from a bad place. We just ask a lot of questions because we want to make sure we're crystal clear about what it is you want us to do. We also don't like um, uh, micromanagers, okay? I don't need you all over my shoulder, right? Tell me what it is you want done, and I'm going to make sure it happens. We're very independent. Thus, how we grew up, right? We're used to fending for ourselves. We also understand technology. We were on the front end of it when it all started. So we totally have an understanding with that, and we're comfortable with it as well, okay? We might be a little too comfortable. I laugh. My, my younger nephews, they tell me that Facebook is for old people because they've moved on to TikTok and, and Instagram. So as old people, we're all into Facebook now and think we did something. But that's kind of a little bit about us, okay? Next, you have your millennials, Okay. This is the, the second largest workforce, second or first, depending on which, which study you look at. But between the millennials and the baby boomers, they make up the largest population. Now, millennials, very good at multitasking. They're very creative, very passionate. They can do this stuff. Now, think about how they grew up, right? These are the children of the Gen Xers, okay? So a lot of times, our course correction was a little too much. I don't mean that in a bad way, but remember I said we as Gen Xers, we came home to single family homes. We came home to nobody there. We had to fend for ourselves. Well, when we had children, we were like, oh, our kids are not going to have to deal with that, right? So we're a lot more hands-on with our kids. We want to know about their feelings. We talk to them a lot, a lot of feedback, okay? We're, this is the generation that came up with the seventh place trophy, you know, and all this type of stuff, right? Why is that important to you when you're designing your new hire uh, process? Because as you see here, they're very passionate and very creative. So they're anxious to show you that. So remember when I said one of the things you can do is give them some work when they come in the door, right? They're all over that. The other thing to know about them, why something like this works for them, they like to hear a lot of feedback, a lot of praise. Why is that? Because we as the parents have created this monster, right? Because this is what we did with them at home right? We were always giving them feedback about any and everything. We were giving them praise. Good job. Great job. Oh, you got a B. That's great. You'll get an A next time. This is how we raise them. So this is what they're used to when they come into the work world, okay? Dress code, they ain't into dress codes and all that kind of stuff. Not saying you can't have one, and if you do, so be it. But again, just understand the dynamics of who you're dealing with. And then finally, depending on your organization, Maybe you have some Generation Zers. These are the people that are coming up right now. Look at when they were born. They were born 
when we had the Great Recession, the war on terror, right? Born in this tech world. So for them, technology is nothing. This is the way they live, okay? They're very independent. They always seem like they're in a rush, and that's because they are. They got stuff to do. They're kind of all over the place. But they have a very strong work ethic. And they also care about money as well. Why is that? Well, some of them grew up and watched their families lose a job, right? They watched that. So it's funny because as some of you maybe are hiring some of these younger employees, right, and you're seeing why they were with you for a short period of time and then they left to go to another job that was paying them maybe more money, that could potentially be a piece of it, okay? So again, just some kind of general characteristics to know about these different generations that are out there. So here I'm going to give you an opportunity now to kind of put this at work, okay? Design your own new hire orientation. So Christina is going to divide you guys into two groups. I think we have enough here to have maybe two groups. I think that'll be, that'll be fruitful. And in your group, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about the next position that you plan to hire in your organization. Just think about who that would be, not who, but like the position or whatever. Think about it, okay? Um, and then I want you to kind of outline for me what would a new hire orientation look like for your company using the map right here. So what are the things you need to do before they get there? What are the things you need to have ready and you would do on the first day? What would you maybe do in the first week? And what would you do in the first 90 days? So kind of thinking about those ideas that I gave you before, I want you to think about how would you be very deliberate and how would you map something like this out? What would it look like? What are some ideas that you think work really well for your organization? Because the way I kind of laid that out may not work perfectly for all of you, but I feel pretty confident in saying there are some pieces there that you're like, yeah, I could do something like that, and I think that would work well within my organization. Obviously, that's based on the scale, what you do, those types of things, okay? And then I want you to just kind of discuss it with your partner. You know, it's kind of a conversation. Hey, here's what my company is. Here's how many employees we have or how many contracts we have, whatever the case may be. Here's kind of what I'm thinking about doing. I maybe would do this on the first day, this in the 90 days. What do you think about that? And I want you all to kind of share some knowledge with each other, share some ideas, and talk with the people in your group, okay? And then when we come back, I'll probably ask both groups to at least share one person's idea. You know, what did your new hire orientation kind of look like when you put it together? Sound good? So what I'm going to do, uh, let me stop my sharing here, okay? So I'm looking at the clock, or yeah, we're good on time. So I'm going to give you guys about, uh, I'll give you guys about 15 minutes to have a good discussion, because I think that's what you'll need to have a really good discussion. So I'll give you guys about 15 minutes in your groups, and then we'll come back, okay, and we'll debrief. I will do what I call ear hustling, so you'll probably see me pop into both of the groups just so I can kind of listen, you know, hear what you guys are talking about or whatever the case may be, and then we'll kind of come back and see what you came up with, okay? So, Christina, if you could divide the group into two groups, that would be very appreciated, and I'll see you guys in 15. Perfect, perfect. Let me have some folks show up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, see, now you see what I was talking about earlier, why we can't do workplace generations in two weeks. <laughs> right. I mean? Like, we, then it's like, okay, he's just talking about the same thing. So, <laughs> I mean, it fits in this. But now, you know, we need to do some of my other stuff and we can revisit that all the way at the end again. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. But I think this is going well. Mm -hmm. I just hate, which is even when I'm teaching, um, you know, when you can't see faces, you know, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't tell engagement, you know, you can't tell or people nodding or they like, yeah, or they, you know, you just can't tell. So that's the yeah. only part I hate about online online training only thing i hate i agree but i think that you know people continuing to show up and you're seeing same face same faces and things like that you know that's a good point i didn't think about it with it's the same people so that that yeah. does say something 
And to that point, um, I'm going to make sure I say, um, matter of fact, if you can look for me, only because I don't have it in front of me. What is my, I, we just said it, my session on the 20 to that new employee having confidence and being willing to put forth that extra effort, right? You're telling me when I came in the door, you handed me this piece of work and you told me some things I needed to know and you told me to go handle it. So you're trusting me with this. You're giving me this level of autonomy, accountability, right? Setting up a new higher experience like I just described with those steps allows you to be able to set very clear and realistic goals for them so they know what it is you expect from them. So those meetings that we talked about, that's an opportunity for you to do this. It gives mastery. It gives an employee kind of specific feedback so you know that they're making progress. So all those different meetings, when I said meet with them after the first week, meet with them after the first month, meet with them after the first 90 days. The reason you're doing that is because you're giving them feedback as they go so they can start to master their craft and give it to you in the way that you want. And finally, if you do this, they will feel like they are making a contribution to your organization and feel like they're having an impact. If you remember that very first slide I showed you, all the research talked about these are some of the things that employees are looking for, and impact and purpose was one of them, okay? So that's all I have. Those are, if you had any formal questions for me, was there anything you wanted to ask, anything that you just wanted to share about what we talked about, um, anything at all? Oh, Latoya, okay, I see your chat here. Um, you said something you took away from your group, a celebration on the first day with cake and balloons. Exactly. You never go wrong with cake. Never go wrong with cake and balloons, right? But you're celebrating like, hey, we are happy that you are here. We're happy that you're joining our team, right? And those types of things go a long way. So, so any questions? Any final questions? Any comments from anyone? Um, I have a question. Have... Oh, sure. Yes, Tanya. Um, what is your take on the great resignation? And what is your, um, first of all, what is your take on it? Do you actually believe that there is one? Or are we using that as an excuse? because of COVID, you know, and what are your suggestions for HR departments or hiring departments moving forward with that? Great question, great question. Um, yes, I do believe the great migration, I believe both. I believe the great migration is real and I do believe that COVID was the excuse for it. Let me explain what I mean and how I think the two are linked. COVID was obviously the catalyst of this, okay? As a result of COVID, there were a number of people who just were not able to work. They maybe were laid off from jobs, whatever the case may be. We know how it, you know, business is closing, all this type of thing. So we know how it impacted people. But I think a funny thing happened with that. People started to reevaluate work and their purpose in it. And I think there was this shift from, I am not going to no longer just live to work. Okay, that's not going to be my focus. I am going to now figure out what it is I really want to do, and I'm going to start pursuing that. And because it's such an employee central uh, situation we're dealing with now, employees can take that chance now because companies are willing to hire them. You know what I mean? See, prior to COVID, let's say you worked in one particular field and now you have an interest in a totally different field well if you didn't have you know 80 years of experience and all types of stuff you had no chance of getting an entry-level position in that new field that's starting to be rethought now and because companies are so starved for employees they're offering all types of perks like training etc and they're willing to take people that don't necessarily have so much experience in what they're looking for because they're like, we'll train you and teach you what we need to do. As long as you have some basic level of skill set, we're willing to take you because we need employees. So a lot of people out there are starting to kind of rethink this employment thing. The other thing that I think is starting to happen is where work is done and how the work day is set up kind of taking a cue from the millennial generation, right? People are starting to, you know, baby boomers and Gen Xers like ourselves, 
we came from the generation of, I called it FaceTime, okay, not the Facebook, not the Apple FaceTime, but FaceTime in the office, okay, meaning you're supposed to be there from 9 to 5, but you want to make sure you're there from 9 to 6 because you want to make sure you're seen and you're in the office. Well, now people are starting to kind of realize um, I don't understand why I need to physically be in the office from 9 to 5. If the work that I need to do can be done in a couple of hours and I can do it from home, I don't understand what the issue is. As long as I do it and I do it in the way you need it and turn it in, why do I physically need to be in the office? And that's challenging for a lot of companies, challenging only because it's a paradigm shift. So the companies that are ahead of the curve, the progressive companies, meaning large and small, they're thinking ahead and saying, okay, maybe we need to redesign work. We need to redesign our work day. We need to step back and look at these job descriptions and look at the positions we have and really hone in on what exactly are the qualifications a person needs for this job. Yeah, I know we used to say you need a bachelor's degree for this. Do they really need a bachelor's degree to be able to do this successfully? In some cases, yes. That's not across every job. I mean, yes, there are some jobs out there where you do need certain advanced degrees, and I get that, but not all of them. So I do think so. Back to the answer to your question, yes, I think the great migration is real, and I think COVID has made a lot of, given, not made, given people an opportunity to rethink their whole approach to work. And because we're in an employee-powered situation right now, they're flexing a little bit and basically saying, look, if I'm going to come work for you, these are the things that I expect to be able to do, and companies are going to have to pivot with that. I mean, that was a survey I read the other day. 70% of the people that responded said that if my office requires me to come back in on a full-time basis, I would quit that company. Think about that, right? Prior to the pandemic, they were going in the office five days a week, but now they flat out said, if my job requires me to have to physically be in the office five days a week, I won't work for them anymore. That's very telling. Okay, that wasn't the case two years ago. So it's those types of things. Did that answer your question? I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Uh, Latoya, I saw you post something. Uh, you have a list. Oh, list of takeaways. You're welcome. I thought you were dipping out on us real quick. Okay, thank you. You're so welcome. Uh, any other questions? Questions about today? Yes. Yeah. I had a question. Um, that was excellent deliverance on how you answered that. And I, I totally, totally agree. Um, but given with the little background that you know of Skinny Mini being a cleaning service, unfortunately, most of the jobs are in the field. Yeah. So with that being said, how would you and what's your expertise or recommendation of go about finding these candidates that can possibly fill these positions? Um, mm -hmm. Where are you looking? Um, because Here's I think we're, we're struggling on that component, you know? Yeah, here's what I say with that. With the whole, like, where do you look? I mean, that's kind of a laundry list. Like, you could look at um, uh, college campuses. You can look at, well, I'll talk about that in a second, like actual okay. pools. But here's okay. the bigger picture. I tell all companies, you need to figure out what your value proposition is from a human capital standpoint. And here's what I mean. The old thinking was, it's all about money and salary. Okay, and a lot of small businesses are quick to say, well, I can't compete with these larger people because I can't offer as much money. And as I showed you at the beginning of this session, it's not all about money. You have to figure out what do you have to offer that appeals to an employee. And that is what you hone in on with respect to marketing your organization to potential candidates. Now, I don't know much about your organization, but what I would bet, just based on what I know you do, one value that you offer is a level of autonomy, right? There's a level of autonomy in their job. They can go and kind of, I mean, I don't know if I'm speaking ignorant, I apologize, but maybe you have some bandwidth where one of the things you have to offer is an extremely flexible schedule, okay? Like, I need my cleaners but I will work with you to make your schedule as flexible as possible for Absolutely. you to be able to do whatever it is you need to do. Well, guess what? That's a selling point for recruiting. You see what I mean? That, that's, a, that's a value proposition that you have. And back to the question, I think it was Tanya who asked me that, or whoever asked me that about the great migration, that's the part that I'm talking about. Like you have people out there now that are going, okay, 
I need to find me a job that's going to allow me to go to school three days a week. Okay, I'm just throwing something out there. You know, that's what I need. I need a job that's going to have that flexibility that allows me to do that, okay? Well, your organization offers something like that. So that's kind of the point I'm getting at. So I would say go back, relook at your organization, and re maybe ask your employees. Like, don't, don't do it on your own. Ask your employees, if I was to kind of quiz you and say, why do you work here? Why are you here? What is it about this organization that not only has you here but keeps you staying here? The answers that you get to that question is going to give you the outline on what your true value proposition is from a human capital standpoint. And once you know that, that's what you use to then go out and market to find people, okay? Mm -hmm. And then as okay. far as where, I mean, you know, that's, you know, you've got your standard job sites, but I always say college campuses are a good place. Think about it. You've got students need, you know, some quick money or whatever the case may be, but they're trying to go to school, career centers and things like that, uh, trade organizations, potentially things like that. Um, for the type of work that you do, and again, that flexible schedule, don't also dismiss social media, like some of those clubs that are out there, you know, that people form within Facebook and all that. Those, look at some of those, what I call untraditional type of sources to maybe look for talent. But before you do that, you need to understand your value proposition so that's what you can sell when you're marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank okay. you, Brent. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. Well, real quick, I wanted to share, um, for because I noticed some of you have kind of been in a number of these sessions, which is very appreciated on my part. Okay, I must be saying something that you're finding of value. The next session that I'm going to be doing on February 20, uh, 21st is called uh, Leading with Intent. And what we're going to focus on in that session is three very specific things. We're going to talk about um, establishing kind of a, a collective problem-solving process within your organization. I'm going to talk a lot about fostering proper communication within an organization and how you go about putting your looking at from a leadership standpoint, looking at what I call the big picture. Okay, I'm going to go through four kind of specific things that you should look at that helps leaders kind of lead with a little more intent. So that's what we're going to be talking about at the session that I'm going to be giving. My next one is uh, Christina has my schedule. You know, I work for her. Uh, I believe it's February 20. First, uh, same time at 11 o'clock. That's a Monday. So um, I look forward to maybe seeing some of you there if you choose. And if not, um, there are some other sessions that I'll be doing as well. So if there are no other questions, this has been wonderful. I hope you all got something from it. Um, it sounds like some of you, from what I heard and what I read, are definitely doing some of these things. So like you mentioned earlier, it's good for you to hear me reinforcement me me reinforce it i can honestly say it's the other way also you know it's good for me to know that the concepts that i've been teaching and, and telling people about there are companies that are actually doing that and more importantly you're finding good results from it so again look at your employees as investments and not expenses and when you do that you'll start to see that a lot of these things start to work okay all right christina that's all Hi. i have all right. Thank you, Brandon, for another amazing workshop. Thank you all for your participation, engagement, and sticking through the entire workshop. Brandon already told you he'll be back in a couple of weeks. Um, and so we want to make sure that you all will be there. You will receive a recording of this session uh, probably tomorrow, and I'll make sure I have the link for the following workshop in that email as well. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Again, get in contact with me if you have an interest in any particular workshop that I can bring in an expert and we can create either a one-off workshop or even a series for. So I look forward to connecting with you all again very soon, and I hope you have a blessed day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. You're welcome. Bye.